prayer will get started on the uh, justice system this morning. So, uh, food is often ingested in chemical form that the small intestine cannot absorb. So to fill to facilitate absorption, the GI tract um, digests food by both mechanical and chemical processes. So just think about food, what it looks like on the plate, and what it looks like after you vomit, or what it looks like coming out the other end. It looks very different. So there's a lot of things that happen to food as we digest it. And so uh, we talk about digestion in what's called the gastrointestinal tract. GI for short, or um, some kind of elementary, I won't give you that term, right? I never use it. But anyways, I usually just call it the GI tract. And it's basically a tube from mouth to anus, as shown here. And um, the bullet points are kind of the, the main functions of digestion. I call it the, the phases. Um, well, for example, we'll start off with ingestion. That just means to get in your mouth. Insert into oral cavity, what we say. Mechanical digestion just refers to, like it says, fragmentation or just the physical pummeling of food. It starts primarily with your mouth, your chompers, your teeth, right? Just chew it up. Chompers. Uh, and also your stomach. When you swallow food and it gets down to your stomach, just the churning of the stomach um, also provides a lively pummeling. So I'll just say churning of stomach. Primarily, mouth and stomach um, provide most of the mechanical digestion. Um, now, propulsion refers to pushing food one way from mouth always towards the anus through a rhythmic contraction of smooth muscle called peristalsis. So, actually, that's the word I'll, I'll use peristalsis. A rhythmic. of the smooth muscle within the GI tract wall. What it accomplishes is propulsion, uh, pushing food one way, always towards the rectum anus. Propulsion of food stuff. That's <coughs> toward the rectum anus. Uh, chemical digestion refers to breaking down the food molecules at the molecular level.
And they kind of like show it with these little acid drops. But they should have put an acid drop up in the mouth because it actually begins in the mouth. But let me define it by saying uh, you break food down at the molecular level. Food broken down at the molecular level. So you want to think about um, the enzymatic activity. Locations, um, oral cavity. What we'll see is we'll study the um, salivary glands that secrete the um, salivary amylase. Well, those break down the starches within your um, oral cavity if you. Say so let starchy rice sit in your mouth for a while. It becomes like a soupy <coughs> pea soup con, um, texture. It, it'll start to taste a little bit sweet because you're breaking down the starches in this, into simple sugars. But you also have uh, most of the chemical digestion in the stomach. There's these gastric glands. We'll study. There's good old HCL that comes from the stomach and the gastric glands. And there is um, pepsin. Think of those peptide bonds in proteins. That those come from stomach. And when you think about food, just think of three things. Carb, C-H-O. Protein, P-R-O, or fat. That's it. Everything else in food is an additive or a preservative or a vitamin or, or something, micronutrients. But th those are the main things that we talk about in, chemi in chemical digestion. The things are broken down to my molecular level. Um, let's see here. So for carbs, starches, that would be like the polymer. The mo monomers are like, you know, the simple sugars like uh, glucose, galactose, maltose. And um, for the proteins, you can break those down into simple amino acids. Those are the monomers. And then for fats, you want to um, liberate those free fatty acids from the glycerol backbone. So for fat, think of triglycerides, TGs, or triglycerides. Well, if you forgot what triglycerides are, you're going to have to go look those up in the, um, in the uh, chemistry chapter. But I'll show you a picture of free fatty acids later. I mean, that, that's the molecule of fat that can be used by muscle cells for beta oxidation, just to burn for energy. Okay, so anyways, chemical digestion is you break polymers down into monomers, basically. And then, when you get into a form where it can be absorbed, that's accomplished, um, well, first of all, okay. Let me talk about the locations where you have this uh, chemical digestion. I, I think I mentioned the stomach. I should have also mentioned um, the duodenum, which is the first part small intestine. Let me erase this. I didn't finish my thought here. Alright, so gastric glands, that's the stomach. Duodenum. It's like first 10 inches of that small intestine. That's where you have the most chemical digestion. That's why they put the four acid drops pointing there. There's a lot of uh, hormones, but just for now, I'll just tell you that this is where the liver and pancreas can secrete their juices to the digestive tract to aid digestion. So I'll put for the duodenum. It 
which means bile, that's from the liver and gallbladder. Liver slash gallbladder. That'll help emulsify fats, as I'll talk about later. But it also receives the, the pancreatic juices. So duodenum is really important. Okay. So stomach, duodenum, accomplish the chemical digestion. They put a couple of acid drops more distal in the small intestine. The small intestine is like 21 feet. And um, all along, if there are things that are left un undigested as you pass through this narrow tube, um, it's about an inch in diameter, you have these brush border enzymes, as they're called. So the rest of the small intestine, I'll put brush border enzymes they'll finish off the chemical digestion and then you're ready for absorption. So you have to think about the epithelium of the small intestine. Um, it, maybe you remember from histology, it's a, um, a simple columnar epithelial tissue with microvilli. And um, what that looks like is columnar cells with these like highly convoluted highly convoluted um, plasma membrane on the absorptive surface on the top there. The brush border enzymes would exist within this brush border. Under the microscope, the microvilli appear as a brush border. That's where the enzymes are. Imagine this thing studded with a variety of different brush border enzymes. I'll just use different colorful dots to illustrate that's where they are. So if anything comes along here and is partially undigested, the brush border enzymes will finish it off. Just breaking down the polymers down more to monomers to accomplish um, absorption. That, that, I have a lot of notes for chemical digestion because that's it. That's the primary function, chemical digestion, so you can absorb it. So the primary way you can absorb things is through the intestinal capillaries. Primarily, the uh, intestinal capillaries. Um, well, capillaries. The capillaries are going to be in these like little. Well, I'll show you later. I'll show you later. Okay, so the thing about it is. Fat globules are a little too big to make it through the vessel wall of the, the capillaries. So fat is absorbed by lymph. That's why they show a lymph vessel there. Lymphatics, well, the name of the structure is lacteal. Absorb fat. Then what is not absorbed, and the primary place where you have absorption is 
something like 21 feet of small intestine. When you get to the large intestine, the colon, there's not much left to absorb. Maybe water and fat-soluble vitamins. Colon absorbs water and fat-soluble vitamins. Absorbing the water um, compacts the feces. You know, when you get to defecation, whatever is um, undigested is eliminated. It's accomplished by the rectum anus. Think of the rectum as a, as a holding chamber. And um, as the walls distend, the reflex is to contract and push it towards the anal canal. Um, I won't teach it in detail, I'll just mention this defecation reflex. Rectal walls distend, that means stretch, because of the feces that are in it. And that causes the reflex, the rectal walls to contract. towards the anal canal. The anal canal around it has sphincters, and that's where you start to feel the urge to go, right? to go in quotation marks. I, mean, I think I know what you mean. But, uh, you know, your feces, um, if you lose that function, they can compact there. And I'll, I'll never forget, one could have only opened. And the abdominal cavity was like really inflated. It looked like the person was pregnant. We opened it up. It was the rectum. And we were all like, oh my gosh. Because you, you know what's in there. We just avoided it. It's crazy. But, you know, I also remember when I was um, an intern. I was like a college freshman. And I was in the geriatric ward. And this nurse was pulling out the feces from this guy. She looked at me very um, distraught. Hey, will, you, will you help me? I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Looks like you're doing pretty good. At that. That's one I avoid. I didn't do that too much in my career. But um, that's one where I kind of. Step aside. So I don't take that reflex for granted. If you, can, if you lose those functions, you need a lot of help. So that's an, that's an overview of the basic functions. We'll go through the details. And I think the good thing to start off with is just the overall structure of the GI tract. What we'll do in histology is I'll show you basically four locations of the GI tract. And just by looking at it, you should be able to tell where you are. Four locations I'll show you. Esophagus, stomach, small intestine, colon. Okay, But all of those places have the same general pattern. Okay, so that's what we'll go through now, the general pattern of the GI tract. Wall. Well, let's go from inner to outer. The innermost part of the GI tract wall that actually touches and agitates the food stuff passing through it. Here's the lumen. That's where food passes through. Okay, but we're talking about the wall around it, the layers of wall around the lumen. Let's start with the mucosa. So 
So um, let's start with the epithelium there. You see how they kind of draw it there? That's kind of cool. Let's see if I can. Uh, I just use blue. But it, um, I tried to just kind of draw. Let me let me do this. Here's the epithelium, and I'll just trace it in blue here. And they have all these glands that empty into it. Okay, so when I trace in blue, that's the epithelium of the mucosa. Now, I won't define it. I mean, it could be a stratified squamous shoot. It could be a simple cuboida, cuboidal. I'll just say for now, you know, this epithelium will change depending on function throughout the GI tract from mouth to anus. If, if the function is protection, do you want to be simple or stratified if the goal is protection? Stratified. stratified. So you can slough off the top layers and the basal layers will replace it. So if the function is um, protection, it's going to be like a stratified epithelium. You know, usually towards the beginning it's stratified and at the end it's stratified, never else in between. Um, it's usually and absorptive or secretion function. So instead of being a stratified squamous, you, you'll usually see for absorption secretion, it's going to be some kind of columnar ET. So we'll, we'll take a look at that as we look at the real histology slide. So the epithelium is the innermost lining of the mucosa. And um, they have all these glands that secrete into the GI tract lumen. So I'll list that. Also, what you have um, The layer underneath the <coughs> epithelium is called the lamina propria. I'm going to um, color this little green thing here. That's a structure. It's the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Photo listed under lamina propria. Uh, well, what the lamina propria is, it's just connective tissue, it's a loose CT. Epithelium, you got glands, you got malt, you got the lamina propria. Um, the outermost layer of the mucosa is this muscle layer. muscularis mucosa, and it's frequently missed by students because it's the only example of a mucosa having a muscle layer, so it's often forgotten by students. So don't forget about the muscularis mucosa of the mucosa. 
I drew, I colored it in red there. So I'll put it on the bottom of the board there. Muscularis. Mucosa. I think it's important for the mucosa to have its own muscle layer. It'll help increase the agitation of food because you have a muscle layer that's really close to the food. I'll just put increase agitation of food. That, that's useful for the digestion process. Have that increase agitation. To mix it up. Just mix the food up. All right, so the mucosa is surrounded by a layer called the submucosa. So on this picture, the submucosa is like, kind of trace around it there. It's kind of like this layer there. surrounding the mucosa it's just more loose connective tissue with a lot of glands. See all the glands that they have here? There's a gland there, they draw a gland here, they draw a gland there. Yeah, I think that's all of them. Uh, so I'm going to erase the board. So for the submucosa, which I traced in that purple color, no one has a loose connective tissue. The structures that are important um, are those glands that I highlighted, but there's only one set of glands I want you to know, and they're in the duodenum. They're called the Brunner's glands, spelled Brunner's. Well, it's pronounced Brunner's called Brunner's. Brunner's glands, but when you say it, say Brunner's glands. Spelled Brunner's location. Duodenum. If you remember from the prior slide, the, the duodenum is right after the stomach. So it's receiving the acidic kind that needs to be neutralized. And uh, the Brunner's glands will secrete an alkaline fluid to neutralize that stomach acid. So they have a very important function. They're located in the submucosa of the duodenum. That, that's where I'll expect you to identify glands. Nowhere else. Alkaline fluid neutralizes stomach acid. The other thing and you can see there's nerves within this layer. Uh, I'm trace them in black. There's these nerves like right there, all the yellow nerves. Whenever you see nerves within the submucosal layer, just call them the submucosal plexus. muscle layer, the true muscle layer, surrounds the submucosa and it's called the muscularis externa. It's external to the muscularis mucosa. Okay, so, um, so this muscularis externa is most, for the most part, it's bilayer. Whereas 
experience. I mean, try to notice that bilayeredness of it. So this inner layer right here, um, I'll just point to it. But, but look how the, um, the cells run in this inner layer. It's like they run circular. So like the grain is this way. They're like in a circle. I'm going to trace like in a circle because they're circular. I want you to notice that. If your muscle arranged in a circle, when you contract, you squeeze. You're going to constrict the lumen. But then the layer outside of that one is longitudinal, and the cells are running this way, perpendicular to it. Yeah, I won't trace the whole thing. It's too busy. But I want you to see that the inner layer, the cells, run circular, but the outer layers, the, they run longitudinal. So that way, when the outer layer contracts, it'll like squish this way. So it's like you contract and you squish, and you contract and you squish. That'll help move the food in one direction. Okay. Like an inchworm thing, you just kind of keep squeezing and shortening, squeeze, shorten. That's why advantageous to have the inner the inner circular layer. of muscularis externa. I'll put inner in parentheses. That's not a formal part of the name. But this is the proper way to name it. Circular layer of muscularis externa. It's always the inner layer. And the, the outer layer is a longitudinal layer. muscularis externa. You can't just say circular layer. That describes nothing. It's the muscularis externa. And um, in between the layers, they have all these nerve fibers. And those are called the, the myenteric plexus. it all up is the serosa or the adventitia. So I'm just going like, to trace the outermost thing here. And they kind of peel it away, going up there off the board, you know, continue it here. What I want you to notice is how the myenteric, um, the mesentery, Right here, where it pinches. So the uh, serosa adventitia <laughs> wraps the whole thing up. And what it does is, when it wraps um, on this end here, this double folding of serosa is called the mesentery. And it's how nerve, artery, vein, um, lymphatics can get to and from the entire digestive tract. So it's a very important structure, the mesentery. But when it's just a layer as a part of the GI tract wall, just call it the serosa or the adventitia. So it might be kind of hard to tell from that. So we'll pretend this is the cut tube, that's the GI tract. The serosa is the outermost layer that wraps it and then pinches on one side right there. So call that serosa or adventitia. 
That's the outermost layer of the GI tract wall. And where it pinches and anchors to the back body wall, your body wall, the inside of your body's cavity, it's lined with It's a, it's a membrane that lines the body wall, and it secretes fluid. Your cavities are fluid filled. So when the parietal peritoneum lines the back body wall, call the parietal peritoneum. When it pinches right here, call the mesentery. That's how nerve artery vein lymphatics get to the GI tract. But when the um, layer, when it's a layer of the GI tract wall, you can call it the serosa. It's also referred to as the visceral peritoneum, aka visceral peritoneum. So those are all the terms. Another term I want you to know is the enteric nervous system. It's kind of the one of, well, it's the lesser known, lesser taught nervous system in basic a &P. We usually spend a lot of time talking about the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. I'll just give mention to the enteric nervous system. This is basically the nervous system of the digestive tract. Um, you can appreciate that when you eat, all you do is chew and swallow. That's what you do with conscious thought. Everything else is autopilot, managed by the enteric nervous system, which is comprised of the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus. So you do need to know that. I'm just going to abbreviate it ENS. It's common what it's abbreviated as, comprised of. My submucosal plexus. I've seen it called mini brain. It's it's a remarkable nervous system. We're not just going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but I just want you to be aware of it's comprised of those two nerve plexuses. Now, this is a model we actually have in the room, and um, well, let me go through the things that we've noted that you should be able to identify. I don't know if all the numbers are in here. We'll start with number one. This is in the small intestine. Well, it says small intestine there, but you know you can always tell when the mucosa is like folded into these finger-like projections for absorption. Those are called the villi. The villi increase the absorptive area for the small intestine. Now, it's a very important that you see what sticks up into these finger-like projections. The green thing, number two, that's lacteal. Um, and you see the blood vessel going up and over? That's an intestinal capillary. That, that's what I mentioned earlier for all of those absorptive purposes. Number three is also pointing to intestinal capillaries. So it's right here surrounding number two, but they don't point to it. But I could. I can point to anything that's here. The other thing you should notice is that um, I put the bracket from anywhere from here on up is considered mucosa. So this is the epithelium that lines the small intestine. And the other thing you should notice is those little, it's like orange, but they put those like little bluish things in there. Those are goblet cells. Those um, help lubricate the area. Anywhere where it's gray, that's what we call the lamina propria. Okay. Um, and also, these things that stick up are the villi. But do you see how like there's an invagination down? That's called a crypt. So the arrangement of small intestine 
if it's a mucosa and it sticks up, that's a villi. But then if it's a pit, call it a crypt. So it kind of goes villi. It sticks up. It's a villi. Villus for short. Villus for singular. Call it intestinal crypt. Thing that sticks down. Well, anyways, that's the arrangement of the mucosa. <clears throat> What's the green thing again? Lacteal, surrounded by the intestinal capillaries. All right, so the gray is lamina That's muscularis mucosa number nine. Muscularis mucosa. So this layer from here to here is submucosa. Number 10, that would be the Bruner's glands. Number 11, that's a big old malt. That's lymphoid tissue, lymph tissue. And if you see yellow, those usually symbolize nerves. So number 7 is the submucosal plexus. Um, 12A and B is the bilayered muscularis externa. It's always bilayered. It's an inner circular or outer longitudinal layer. There's one spot where it's trilayer, that's the stomach. So on the stomach, we'll see three sublayers of the muscularis externa. Number 13, that's the monetary plexus. And then you can see the serosa um, at the very bottom there. Okay. And um, I took a close up picture of this model there. They have the layers of the, of the wall. Very simply, it's, well, as you can see, submucosa. <laughs> I'm sorry, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, both layers, circular and longitudinal, and then the outermost layer is serosa. And the coloration of the model, it, it is similar to what you see in cadavers. Okay, that's kind of what it looks like. Now, the large intestine is shown here, ascending, transverse, descending colon, and they show the same layers, mucosa, submucosa. This is a circular layer. This is a longitudinal layer. And notice how it's not a complete layer, it's just a band. That's kind of the situation in the colon. But anyways, then 11 is the serosa. So you are expected to identify layers within some of our models as well. And you're also expected to identify some of those mesenteries that I mentioned. And again, the idea of the mesentery is that you have a lining of the cavity, that's called the parietal peritoneum, if it lines the organ, it's a visceral peritoneum, and if it's a double pinching that anchors to the back body wall, call it a mesentery. So some organs that are in your body cavity, when you just kind of remove the abdominal wall and you see it in the body cavity, we call that intraperitoneal. But in development, some things are pushed behind the body wall, and that's called retroperitoneal. So retro simply means it's behind, it's posterior to the parietal peritoneum. <clears throat> So when I see things that are retroperitoneal, I'm, I'm kind of staring through this, this membrane. Okay. Um, it's like if you put like a big sheet of saran wrap over me and like fasten me to the whiteboard, and you can kind of see me through the saran wrap, right? It's kind of like that. 
And there are many things that are retroperitoneal. I'll, I'll kind of go through them as we get there. Um, but anyways, I just want you to know the concept. So intraperitoneal, it's in the body cavity. So the, I try to teach these things because the models don't do a good job of showing intra and retro. You really have to look at a cadaver. Well, anyways, if you look at the sagittal section of the abdominal cavity, it helps to kind of draw out the organs and, and kind of trace the peritoneum around them so you can kind of learn the names of some of the mesenteries. Of this, um, if you have the body cavity and you cut it open and you see the lining, um, you should probably fill in some of the organs there. Like at the top, we have the liver there at the top. Right below that, they have a cross section of the stomach. So liver, stomach, then I'm going to draw transverse colon, and all these cut little tubes that represent 21 feet of intestine. Junior million, those are parts of the small intestine. So, okay, so you got it. Transverse colon, so I'll, I'll label these things. Stomach, and there's colon, part of the large intestine, and below that, I won't draw all the little loops, I'll draw, say, five of them. This one, three, four, five. Let's do this. So those are the most of the organs there. Now, if you start to trace the peritoneum around the body cavity, you have pancreas and duodenum retroperitoneal. So let me draw those in. The pancreas is in a space behind the stomach. So I'm going to draw a little space for pancreas here. And then the duodenum will draw behind transverse colon. And these structures are retroperitoneal. We get there. What happens is this is going to line the body cavity. This is going to go over the liver there. So let me draw it a little more on the liver. Hold on. So we kind of get a clear picture there. Let's see. There we go. Sorry for the squeaky pens, but um, I'm just going to trace all around the liver there. All right, so let's remember our terms. If, it's, if I'm drawing a blue line on the back body wall, or even on the front body wall, if it lines the body cavity, what's the term? Which peritoneum is it? It's the parietal one. But if I draw a blue line right on an organ like the liver, which peritoneum is it? It's the visceral peritoneum. So if it's right on the organ, this will be peritoneum. Notice how I left a little bald spot right there. There is a little bare area of the liver that's not covered with peritoneum. 
it's the bare area, well, of the liver, and it's actually called that. Well, anyways, I'll, I'll keep drawing the, um, the peritoneum. There's a peritoneum, and there's a mesentery that shoots down from the liver, the stomach right here. It's called the lesser omentum. right there called lesser omega. It's between liver and stomach. And there's a greater omentum. I call it the fat apron. It's a mesentery that's laden with fat. It drapes all the way down and it comes all the way back up. It goes from stomach to transverse colon. There's this fat apron called the greater omentum. this whole thing called the greater omentum. It goes from stomach to transverse colon. Now to an anchor the transverse colon to the back body wall, we have the transverse mesocolon back there. So in my picture, I'll just kind of like connect this to that. And on mine is a little bigger, I'm exaggerating it, but that right there that anchors the transverse colon to the back body wall is the transverse mesocolon. I'm going to draw a mesentery that shoots out from the back body wall and it's going to wrap around all of the intestines. And that completes it. Anyways, the, um, the root of this mesentery right there that anchors all the small intestine to the back body wall is called the root of the mesentery. It's a very simple name. Right the root of the mesentery. There, there are more. Those are the main ones I want you to know. Let's kind of reiterate them. Um, you have the lesser omentum. Know where they go from. Liver to stomach. Liver to stomach. Lesser omentum. Then greater omentum from stomach to the transverse colon. Then the transverse mesocolon, which anchors that structure, the back body wall. And then the root of the mesentery. Let me see if I'm forgetting anything. I think that's it. <coughs> So you're expected to identify mesenteries as well. And um, I have some pictures that kind of help you look at other perspectives of the mesenteries. So the lesser omentum, it's between the liver and the stomach. And so look, looking at it from a frontal view, that's it right there. It's called the lesser omentum because this is called the lesser curvature of the stomach. Lesser omentum. This is the greater curvature of the stomach, so that's the greater omentum. Let's remember that the greater omentum, it goes from stomach to transverse colon. So if you lift up the fat apron, you expect to see the transverse colon. And that's this picture here. They lift up the fat apron, and you can see transverse mesocolon right there. Um, here it is on a model. 
That's the duodenum, that's pancreas, that's the transverse colon. If that's the transverse mesocolon, and that's the transverse colon, what's that? Greater momentum, the fat apron. Okay, well. All right, so those are kind of the, uh, the overview topics, you know, mesenteries are, you know, you know, the general tract, the general structure of the GI tract. Um, now I kind of want to take a survey of the GI tract. We'll start with the oral cavity and we'll end up here. Kind of the view of the, uh, the dentist. I won't do too much about the um, the anatomy of the oral cavity. I, I just have a couple of structures there. I don't like when they put oral cavity. It, it's basically the space between tongue and roof of the mouth. space between lips and gums or cheeks and gums. The word for gums in anatomy is gingiva. Uh, for cheeks, they use the term buccal. For lips is labrum. If you ever see those terms, it's just referring to lips or cheeks or gums. And the world has to be like where you put a mouthpiece. Well, there's some other anatomy here, and I taught this before, but I don't know if you remember, if you look in your, uh, your respiratory notes, remember the fossies right there, the back of your mouth, that's the uvula, the soft palate, and you can see your palatine tonsils right there, right there in the fossies. Okay. Uh, you have your chompers, that's what I'm going to talk about next, but um, before chompers, let's do the things that help you digest. The salivary glands and the oral cavity, um, and also the teeth. I'll spend the most time talking about those, because salivary glands and teeth are for digestion. Um, the salivary glands, there are three of them. And um, anything that secretes something into part of the digestive tract is called an accessory gland of digestion. secrete into the digestive tract, but they're not part of the digestive tract. So the salivary glands would qualify. They're not in the tract, but they secrete in the mouth, which is part of your digestive tract. Um, so the salivary glands are parotid, submandibular, sublingual. Three of them. Three 
two salivary glands, parotid, submandibular, uh, sublingual. Now the parotid salivary gland, they all have ducts, okay? But usually the ducts are hard to see on models, but the parotid always has a nice duct right there. It, it's usually seen piercing the buccinator muscle and it empties right, right around your second or third molar of your upper jaw, okay? So be able to identify the parotid uh, gland, um, and it's duct. They all have ducts, but that parotid duct is one I usually ask you to identify. Um, the other thing is, know the innervation. Um, nine, fatal nerve nine for the parotid. Glossopharyngeal is seven for the other two. Spatial. So know the innervation as well. This is a, um, a visceral motor function. Okay. Let's see. For the histology, you should know that what saliva is to help you digest food. It's a lubricating digestive fluid. The cells that secrete the saliva in the salivary glands, it's either going to be a watery fluid with the amylase, those are the serous cells, but you also have mucus cells that secrete mucins that help moisten and lubricate the food. The serous cells, because they secrete a protein, they usually take up a stain that make it stain dark. But because mucins don't take the stain well, under histology they stain light. So that's kind of a clue to know what you're looking at. If it stains dark or if it stains light, you kind of know the type of salivary secretion. So it's either going to be a combination of uh, watery, it's got the amylase. So let's look at this illustration of histology. Um, what the salivary gland secretes, it depends, it determines the duct length. A watery secretion travels well down a long duct. However, a mucus secretion would not travel well down a long duct. You'll just get all clogged up along the way. So if you're going to secrete a mucusy secretion, it helps to have a shorter duct length. And if it's more watery, you can have a longer duct length. And if it's a mixture of both, maybe you could be somewhere in between. Now it turns out, the parotid gland, it has the longest duct. The submandibular has kind of like a medium length duct. And the, short, the shortest ducts right underneath your tongue are the sublingual. Just stand in front of a mirror, open your mouth and lift up, lift up your tongue. You can see saliva collecting there. And those are the ducts of the sublingual gland. Shortest ducts. So based on telling you that, you can tell what kind of secretions they have. Um, mostly mucus for the sublingual. Submandibular, which has the medium length, it's kind of a mixture of light and dark, serous and mucus. And then, of course, all dark over there, it's basically totally serous. So, become familiar with that histology for the uh, salivary glands. So, based on histology, you should be able to identify them. 
based upon anatomy, you should be able to identify them. The product duct is the biggest one. It's right next to your ear. You ever take a first bite of food and you feel a tingling? I do sometimes, and you're stimulating this duct to secrete. The other two, based on their name, you should be able to find them, correct? Underneath the tongue, sublingual, or by underneath the jaw, submandibular. All right, so the salivary glands, um, this is a good spot for a break. When we'll come back, we'll talk about the muscles of mastication.